This is Talking Foreign Policy, a critical look at Canada's role abroad, and I'm Eve Engler. And today we're going to be talking about um, the foreign interference panic uh, in this country and um, Bill C-70, uh, a recently passed legislation uh, countering uh, foreign interference. To me, the foreign interference panic is principally a U.S. intervention in Canadian politics. It's a way to prod this country, despite opposition from important segments of corporate Canada, to joining the U.S. bid uh, to contain uh, China's rise. And if you look at the institutions in this country kind of pushing the foreign interference uh, issue, uh, pushing the conflict with China issue, they are the institutions that are the most uh, connected, deeply integrated with the, uh, the U.S., being uh, the Canadian military, uh, CSIS, communication security establishment. But even if you look at it at a personal level, down at the individual level, you'll find that a number of the individual commentators pushing the foreign interference uh, a frenzy, they are in fact uh, funded by the US government for their lobbying in Canada. So for instance, uh, Metne Tati, who's the uh, head of the U Uyghur Rights Advocacy Project, uh, who's been quoted dozens of times uh, about Chinese interference in Canada. He, his organization was actually set up in 2020 with funding from the U.S. government explicitly to uh, lobby Canada's parliament. Um, so at a macro level, that's my thesis about the uh, uh, foreign interference buhaha we've been seeing over the past handful of years. Um, within that, um, we, today we have a uh, lawyer and activist, Dimitri Lascaris, to uh, break down some elements of uh, the foreign interference uh, discussion. Uh, he's written a couple pieces recently uh, detailing uh, legislation, the Bill C-70, but also um, a piece that talk, looks at the claims that were made um, uh, around uh, Chinese interference and um, uh, the role that CSIS has played in, in kind of pushing those claims and whether they're, they're to be trusted. So uh, first of all, uh, thanks for coming on, uh, Talking Foreign Policy, Dimitri. Pleasure to be here, Eve. Thank you for having me. And and can you just sort of like break down this question? First of all, I guess maybe if you have any comment on the kind of macro picture, but then into the... Um, about you know what is foreign interference in Canada, but then also in terms of um, the piece you wrote around whether CSIS is a sort of credible, uh, that they should just be taken at their face or trusted with their allegations without sort of receiving uh, the evidence of what's uh, uh, of their claims. So I, I think you and I are partly in agreement uh, and we also partly diverge on the macro picture. I agree that it's entirely fair to characterize this as uh, a U.S. intervention. Uh, when it comes to Canadian foreign policy, so much about our foreign policy is ultimately dictated from Washington uh, in, in a variety of ways, whether we like it or not. And that's the reality of the situation. But I don't think the principal opposition in Canada to this foreign interference hysteria, you called it panic. Uh, I think that's fair. I call it hysteria. Um, is being uh, driven principally by sectors of the mining industry. I think there are elements, there are particular constituencies within the Canadian mining industry. And by the way, we have the biggest mining stock exchange in the world, the TSX, the Toronto Stock Exchange. The mining industry is extremely powerful in this country. But most of the mining industry is aligned with the neocons in Washington. Their agendas overlap and uh, they're not in conflict. There are some companies but none of them, I think, is particularly influential in the in the conversation who are opposed to, you know, straining relations with countries like China and India and Russia. Uh, but for the most part, the mining industry in Canada is not invested in the jurisdictions which have been deemed by the neocons to be the official enemies of the West. For the most part, they are invested in jurisdictions which the Western governments, including the neocons in Washington, are exploiting ruthlessly. For example, Africa uh, and South America. Uh, and so forth. So uh, I think the principal opposition in Canada to the belligerents, and they're trying to build public sh support for belligerents towards Russia and towards China and towards Iran and so forth, is coming from the anti-imperialist movement and the left, which in this country, despite all of their 
weaknesses and limitations are considerably more influential than they are in the United States. And we are particularly concerned in this country about, um, you know, there's so much talk about increasing military spending because we in this country want our government to focus on things like health care. We're accustomed to having a robust system of national health care. And a lot of Canadians are cognizant that if we start shifting huge amounts of money to military spending, which uh, is exactly what the neocons in Washington want us to do, and the military industrial complex in the United States wants us to do, then there's going to be less money for health care spending, uh, for our social insurance program, for our educational system, and so forth. So I think that the foreign inf interference hysteria is primarily targeting the left and the anti-imperialist move in this country. It's not primarily designed to stifle dissent within the mining industry, which I think is largely aligned with Washington. So that being said, and you know, I, I, I find your interpretation plausible. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's hard to know because you and I don't have a, a hotline to Washington or to Ottawa exactly what's going on. I think your interpretation is certainly plausible, but I, uh, on the evidence, I tend towards the one that I've just articulated. Now, in terms of, let me start with Bill C-70, and then maybe I'll pause there and we can talk about uh, uh, the foreign interference report uh, that the National Security Intelligence Committee put out earlier in June. Bill C-70 does a lot of things. It, this is a countering foreign interference piece of legislation, which was rammed through Parliament with the cooperation of all the other political parties in Parliament, effectively. They all signed on to this being rammed through with no meaningful debate. And it amends a lot of legislation. Uh, I didn't have time because this happened so quickly and this bill is so huge and complex to go through all of its uh, provisions and then see how it was amending existing leg legislation like the criminal code, like the CSIS Act and other pieces of legislation uh, to determine whether there was a concern, a civil liberties concern or other concern. I focused on one particular piece of legislation that is being amended by Bill C-70. Uh, and that legislation is called the uh, Security uh, of Information Act. I didn't even know this act existed uh, until uh, I, I read Bill C-70, which should tell you something. I've been practicing law for over 30 years. If I didn't know this bill existed or this legislation existed, probably the vast majority of Canadians have no idea. And the Security of Information Act, as it was written before Bill C-70 came into effect, imposes the most severe penalty that Canada's constitution permits, which is life imprisonment. We don't permit capital punishment in this country on those who use threats, accusations, or violence to benefit foreign entities. So section 20 of this, the existing, the pre-existing legislation is the one that I focused on the most. And what that said before Bill C-70 was enacted was every person commits an offense who at the direction of, for the benefit of, or in association with a foreign entity or a terrorist group induces or attempts to induce by threat, accusation, menace, or violence, any person to do anything or cause anything to be done that and this is the key part or two of the key parts, A, is for the purpose of increasing the capacity of a foreign entity or a terrorist group to harm Canadian interests, or B, that is reasonably likely to harm Canadian interests. So the penalty for this is life imprisonment if you violate this provision, Section 20 of the Security of Information Act. But in order for the Crown to prove your guilt, it had to show that basically you were uh, intending to cause harm to Canadian interests or uh, your behavior was reasonably likely to harm Canadian interests. So Bill C-70 eliminates those requirements completely. So the Crown no longer has to prove any harm to Canadian interests. It doesn't have to prove that there was even a risk of harm to Canadian interests. It doesn't have to prove that you sought to harm Canadian interests. Furthermore, it adds the word intimidation to the preamble. So uh, you know, the way it's drafted now is you have to do, you have to engage in a threat, accusation, menace, or violence. They've added the word intimidation. And this is very concerning because we are seeing a lot of claims within uh, the public discourse in Canada 
that perfectly legitimate forms of protest and dissent constitute intimidation. To give an example, you know, which a lot of our listeners will be familiar with, there are many pro-Israel students on the university campuses of Canada right now who claim to be intimidated by these encampments that have sprung up, even though the protesters in these encampments have not engaged in any violence or threats of violence. They say they're intimidated just because they use the word intifada, which in Arabic means shaking off. They're intimidated because they hear the word revolution. They're intimidated because the encampment protesters are condemning Zionism, which is an ideology, not a religion, not an ethnicity. It's an ideology. They're intimidated because people are wearing the kafiyah, uh, which has great cultural and historical significance for Palestinians, is not in any way, shape, or form uh, a threat or a menace. So, and I could go on and on. In my article on my website, I give other examples of how so-called intimidating conduct is in fact legitimate uh, and time-honored forms of protest and dissent. So this legislation, in my view, and as I said, I haven't done a comprehensive review because it's just too dense. There's too much in it for me to do that uh, by myself within the limited time that was afforded to us. But this legislation is effectively, in my view, criminalizing in the most severe way potentially legitimate forms of protest and criticism against Canada's morally bankrupt foreign policy. We should be deeply concerned about this. And personally, as a lawyer, because I wasn't able to stop it from being passed into law, I would be happy as a lawyer to challenge this under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And I'm frankly looking for opportunities to do that because I think this law is an absolute travesty. And we should say that it was like six weeks from when it was presented to adopt it, which is my understanding is like absolutely even the post 9 11 uh terrorism legislation that was rammed through quickly my understanding is this was passed even quicker uh than that um mm -hmm. and there was very little like i i'm like you and actually until your article i you know i seen a little bit here and there i uh uh rabble published john price's piece where there was like 14 uh civil society organizations that that called for slowing down the process and to have a more you know full debate but it was very limited kind of debate in the public arena on this on this legislation, which has uh, fairly uh, significant ramifications. I, I was just one of the things I found kind of like uh, maybe ironic in, in that is that, you know, uh, if if you start um, uh, saying that intimidation is a, is a threat and be criminalized, the especially around Israel, the the you know the role of Israeli influence. This bill could actually serve to reinforce Israeli influence in Canada, which, in my opinion, is more significant than Chinese interference, um, because it would, it would bring, in, bring in criminalizing those who were intimidating politicians or others who were you know enabling Israel's uh, Holocaust in Gaza. So so that would be. Uh, and, and I just want to say, you know, Eve, something that's very personal to you. Uh, our listeners may not know. But you, as I recall, were visited by RCMP officers at your home. Why, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it was because you ran into the foreign minister at the time. Uh, who's the former astronaut? What's his name again? Mark uh, Garneau. Mark Garneau. I'm sorry, I forgot that, Mr. Garneau. Uh, but I think you ran into him in the street or something, and he got into a car. And you, you have no record of violence whatsoever. You popped into the car and started questioning him like a journalist about his, you know, morally bankrupt support for various uh, nefarious Canadian foreign policies. And the next day, the RCMP showed up at your house. And uh, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but I understood that they were more or less intimating that you had engaged in threatening or intimidating behavior. I can't think of a person, to be perfectly honest with you, Eve, who is more at risk under the new legislation than you, because you and for you engage in vigorous, and by the standards of the mainstream media, shall we say, aggressive, but perfectly nonviolent uh, forms of journalism and activism. And this is exactly, you're exactly the kind of person, as am I, you and I have done some of these things together, right? Uh, you and I are uh, really at risk under legislation of this nature because of this amorphous concept of intimidation. Yeah. So, so yeah, so, so, but, okay, so now it's, it's just uh, on the legislative angle. So it's got... Um, I think it was on the 20th, it, it 
passed. I guess they rammed it through the Senate just before the Senate closed for the summer is my understanding. But so now it's just, it will be law as of what actually transpires, do you know, in terms of um, the coming weeks or it is actually law as of today, they they are modified or is that that still takes some days to play out? Well, it, 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 it passed third reading. So it now I, I don't know whether they've actually, uh, you know, gone through the formality, but basically the Trudeau government has to declare it into law. Okay. Uh, so I don't know whether he's actually done that, but it, it, if it isn't already, if uh, you know, effectively uh, the law of the land, it will be very shortly. And there's really uh, nothing that can be done to stop that. Once the legislation actually is in effect, and it may already be in effect, uh, you know, it, it could be subjected to charter challenges. And I, as uh, anybody out there who's listening to this and who feels that they are, their rights under this legislation have been violated or may be violated, uh, I feel so strongly about this. I'm prepared in an appropriate case to represent uh, a charter litigant on a pro bono basis. This law must be challenged. So, so now shifting gears to the other um, kind of element to this, which is okay. So, is all this foreign interference, boohaha in Canadian politics, panic? Uh, you know, we had to like rush this legislation through because we're under some uh, panic around foreign interference. That was the kind of argument being made um in in parliament i guess um now we've been hearing all this business about mps being wittingly or unwittingly uh working with uh foreign government uh they don't name names there was this report that came out last month from um or i guess in in, in may from uh mariog the the justice that's overseeing her preliminary report on uh foreign interference and she gave the the media the dominant media what they wanted which was that china is the big uh source of foreign interference in canada and um and uh, and then uh, you know it, which is interesting i think it is important to remember that it was only back in 2018 and 2019 where you know the front page of the walrus magazine was all about how russia's influence uh, intervening on canadian democracy right so they in 2018, 2019, we set up, the government set up this sort of commission to protect elections, which was not about China, but was about Russia and alleged Russian influence, which was because, of course, the claim was that Hillary Clinton, uh, you know, that Russia had got Donald Trump elected and defeated Hillary Clinton. And so that was supposed to be, you know, Russia was going to then target our elections and stuff like that. So that foreign interference stuff is then, you know, has now over the past couple of years shifted towards China. Um, but the the main source in this, as I mentioned uh, in, in the in the intro, that you know you see the Canadian military that wants conflict with China. They've you know head of the military last year saying uh, China sees itself at war with Canada and its allies, um, uh, sending naval vessels there, setting up a base there that goes back to 2017. Uh, and then you have the communication security establishment and pushing to ban Huawei and the whole business with arresting Meng Wanzhou in 2018, which was about you know weakening Huawei, which is China's uh, first real sort of global uh, high tech company that was you know taking taking the world. Um, and then now, in really, I think recently, CSIS has really been the source of most of these kind of claims of of uh, of foreign um, uh, interference of you know that there's politicians or whatever that are working for China. Um, when you delve into it, they don't really provide much detail. Like what we have on the public record, one of the the kind of the most, I would say, strongest piece they seem to have on the public record is this idea that Handong, there was like some international students, Chinese international students that were bussed into a writing association um, uh, electoral battle in the Toronto area to support Handong which, you know, is, and the, the Chinese consulate may have been behind that. So, you know, that would be a form of intervention. And if you think about it, it's not very, it's not, not very big in terms of its claim of intervention, but this is one of the things that, but most of it's kind of left in pretty vague um, uh, kind of, uh, you know, don't give us much detail. But so you published a piece kind of saying like, should we trust CSIS? And can you just give us a little bit of a background on that and, and you know, how that fits into what we, understanding of the foreign interference kind of claims. So this report, the foreign interference report, and by the way, this is all connected, right? They're releasing this report in heavily redacted form now because they're trying to push through this repressive anti-democratic legislation. It's not just Bill C-70, it's also the Online Harms Act, which fortunately has not yet been passed. 
They didn't ram that through parliament before the summer break. So that's still a battle we can win. But they're putting this report and this hysteria out there to generate acquiescence in the rapid passage of this repressive legislation, the Online Arms Act and Bill C-70, the Countering Foreign Interference Act. That's what's going on here. People need to understand that. So they put out this report in heavily redacted form in the early part of June, a month ago, after having given it to the prime minister in unredacted form in March. Uh, and uh, I've read the report. It's about 84, 85 pages long, and it is chock full of redactions, hundreds of redactions. And the source that the authors of the report, this is the National Security Intelligence Committee of Parliament, NS NSI COP. That's what the, the acronym is, okay? Um, they cite CSIS repeatedly in the report uh, and far more than all other sources combined. The report, I can assure you, I read the report twice. I did it as somebody who has decades of experience in litigation. So I brought to bear my experience. I'm not infallible, but I brought to bear my extensive experience in the evaluation of evidence. And I didn't find one piece of hard evidence in that entire report either. Absolutely nothing. It was really just CESA says this and CESA says that. It talks about this thing where these students were bussed in, uh, you know, for a nomination contest, uh, uh, allegedly at the insistence or the request of the Chinese government. And there may be evidence to back up that that happened, that the Chinese government caused a bunch of students to show up at this nomination contest. But I haven't seen it. It's not in the report. There's no hard evidence. There's no hard facts. And in fact, just so people understand, uh, you know, that the evidence isn't in the unredacted port report either. Elizabeth May, as I did mention in my article about this, the Green Party of Canada leader, went through all of the hoops to get access to this classified information, uh, read the unredacted report, then did an interview with the Hill Times, a long interview uh, in a Hill Times podcast a couple of weeks ago, which I listened to twice. And in it, she said, look, and she's a lawyer. By training, that's what she is. She's a lawyer. She said, this isn't really evidence. And there are really no hard facts. There's a lot of analysis. And she said, I myself find this very reliable. But she admitted that it's not evidence. It doesn't contain hard facts. And she even said that, uh, you know, earlier in her career as a leader of the Green Party of Canada, a solicitor general of Canada told her uh, that Maher Arar, a Syrian Canadian who was tortured in Syrian jails after he was rendered there by the United States with the, uh, you know, collaboration, it appears, of CSIS, that he was a really bad actor. That's what the solicitor general told Elizabeth May about Maher Arar, and it came from CSIS. And this man was tortured. This man received an apology from the Canadian government. There was a settlement in excess of $10 million. And Elizabeth May says, you know, I learned from that experience. Take what uh, CSIS has to say with a note of caution. I think that that is a gross understatement. CSIS has repeatedly been caught lying by the Federal Court of Canada. Uh, CSIS uh, has smeared two veteran police officers, Canadian police officers, based on nothing. This was reported by Al Jazeera last year. Uh, CSIS uh, was aware that other Canadians were uh, being sent to Syria to be tortured and didn't tell its superiors about this. I could go on and on, but when you look at the totality of the record of CSIS, it is a totally unreliable source, completely unreliable. Now, that doesn't mean everything that CSIS says is false. What it does mean is that if you're acting rationally, you shouldn't take CSIS at its word. You should say, look, show us the goods. If you make a claim against somebody, anybody, a foreign government, a Canadian, a member of parliament, a former member of parliament, as CSIS has done in very serious way, um, show us the evidence. And if you're not prepared to show us the evidence, we're not going to assume that what you're saying is true. That's what rational people would do. But this committee the members of whom are not all members of parliament, they've they've appointed some senators, unelected senators to this committee. You know, so it's not even a, a democratically representative. These people uh, are drinking the Kool-Aid. You know, they they believe whatever CSIS says, apparently. There's not an, any indication whatsoever in their entire report that they applied any degree of healthy skepticism to what CSIS said, despite all of these instances, documented instances, some of which I've mentioned, of uh, CSIS deception.
Yeah, well, I mean, we saw that uh, when uh, the former Governor General uh, David Johnson uh, headed up the uh, in initial interference uh, inquiry, he was basically hounded out of the position by the media saying that you're not you're not telling us that uh, we should all trust ISIS and that China's uh, you know controlling our government, right? So it, is, it has been, and even Elizabeth May was sort of forced, kind of a little bit to like walk back a bit of her 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 um, initial reaction to the report when Jagmeet Singh joined in and saying this is so troubling and 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 um and uh, I, I, I said I've read the report at least the unredacted version I don't know what Jagmeet Singh what drug that man is smoking because there ain't nothing in there nothing which establishes even with a reasonable degree of likelihood that a member of parliament has betrayed this country or is collaborating with some hostile foreign power there's nothing to back that up but there, but the the whole ethos in the media is is that um, you know this and and the NDP. Let's be clear about this. NDP has actually been very hawkish on China and has been criticizing uh, for many years now the the uh, liberals from I would say from a you know a pro uh, Washington kind of kind of uh, kind of perspective on this. Another piece in all of this that we should. Um, uh, I guess bring to the table is that in the budget, what all of this sort of foreign interference kind of uh, frenzy has led to concretely is a huge boost in CSIS's budget, right? CSIS got $655 million um, increase over eight years to focus on foreign interference, right? That was added in the, the most uh, recent liberal uh, liberal budget. So, so this has been the frenzy beyond uh, pushing Canada towards a more belligerent position towards China. Concretely, this has been good for those institutions, notably CSIS kind of pushing the frenzy. And also, I would say it's been good for the Canadian military and that the, the more you hype up the China threat, um, that's part of the justification for these, you know, significant uh, boosting of military spending that we've been we've been seeing. So it's important to see that the institutional benefit um uh from these sort of uh these kind of uh policies uh, uh eve i just want to if i may because uh, this is very important what you just said um i just want to drive this point home a lot of people you know in this country uh, and understandably so they're very concerned about more immediate issues and they don't they're kind of vaguely aware about foreign interference and they're concerned about it but they're not paying careful attention to the debate you should pay careful attention to this debate it will impact you enormously in my article about this, uh, I said at the very end, I didn't know, by the way, about the increase in funding for CSIS that just passed. I'm not even remotely surprised. And this is what I wrote without knowing about that. By manufacturing hysteria around alleged foreign interference by the West official enemies, the committee, this security intelligence committee, and its accomplices in the intelligence community and corporate media seek to generate public support for three objectives. One, the West's increasingly belligerent and dangerous posture towards Russia, China, and Iran. Most people don't want war. They're trying to build support for war. Number two, increase government spending on national security, which is what you just revealed, and the military. And three, censorship, particularly censorship in regard to Canadian foreign policy. And the more money, as we all know, that gets shifted to the military and to the national security agencies, the less money there is for our healthcare system, for our educational system, for affordable housing, and on and on, for poverty alleviation, for a clean environment, so this issue, this foreign interference hysteria actually is of great importance to each and every Canadian. And I would recommend to our listeners with the greatest of respect that we pay very careful attention to this debate with a healthy dose of skepticism. We'll leave it there. Uh, thanks a lot for coming on to Talking uh, Foreign Policy. Thank you, Eve. Always a pleasure.